Okay, thanks for everyone for joining. Um, again, we have Fran McKeon with us tonight. She is from the Higher Education Access Partner with FIA um, in the Southwest region. She's been with FIA for 18 years and she has been in the financial aid business for 40 years. Um, she's a wealth of information and we are grateful every year that she joins us uh, to inform our families about financial aid and the upcoming changes um, you know, that we've experienced in the last year with FAFSA. Um, so Fran, thank you again, and we're gonna pass it over to you. Um, if any families have questions, since the Q&A is not working right now, um, if you could please email me, my email is fim at pdsd.org. Again, fim at pdsd.org, and we'll be sure to get those questions um, answered when we send out the link to the recording. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fran McEwen and I work for FIA, Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency. My email is here. So, um, you know, if you have questions afterwards, in addition to any questions you might send to counselors, please, you feel free to send me an email and I'll be glad to try to answer you. So, the topics we're going to cover tonight uh, one is called Financial Aid Made Simple. We're going to talk about scholarships federal and state aid, student and parent loans, the FAFSA, of course, free application for federal student aid, what happens when you start getting your financial aid notifications, and then I'll give you some web resources at the end. <clears throat> so um, first, what we always encourage families to do is look for the free money first. So they want to exhaust all scholarships and grants because they are free money that do not have to be repaid. You also have to know your specific deadlines at your schools. So every school will have a different deadline that they want you to file the FAFSA by. So you have to make sure you know what that is. You're gonna fill out the FAFSA. You can't do it yet because it's being delayed and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then once you fill out the FAFSA, <clears throat> have it sent to all your schools, student gets accepted to schools, you'll start getting notifications and you'll be able to compare your financial aid office, offers talk as a family as to which one makes sense and how you can afford the college that your student wants to attend the most. So the federal government says that paying for a college education is a joint responsibility of the student and the parent to the extent possible. So they have you complete the FAFSA to determine if you have financial need. And if you do, you may get need-based aid. Uh, there is the federal formula that sits behind the FAFSA that determines whether or not a student has financial need. Not everybody will qualify for financial need. So you have to do this FAFSA and, and you know, be determined eligible. But there are some merit-based programs that students can be considered eligible for. <clears throat> so the three types of financial aid that we will talk about, one we consider gift aid. So that's money you don't have to, be, have to repay. And that could be grants or scholarships. One we call self-help. And that's where a student may be working to help themselves pay for college, whether they work a job outside of school or there's a federal work study job on campus, they're helping themselves to pay their educational expenses. Also, some students may have saved while working in high school. They may have saved to um, help pay their educational expenses. And then of course there's loans. There's federal loans, private loans, there's loans for students and there's loans for parents. <clears throat> The different funding sources, the federal government offers both grants and loans. The state government and we at FIA administer the Pennsylvania State Grant Program. We also administer a bunch of other programs for the state and federal government, and they would be on FIA.org under other funding opportunities. And there's a bunch of them you can look at. But the main program we administer is the Pennsylvania State Grant. So we'll be considering students for that. The colleges or schools that the student applies to may have their own form of financial aid. And that could either be need-based or it could be merit-based. And finally, there are scholarships available. <clears throat> so as far as applying for financial aid, you're going to have to complete the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. So all schools will be asked to complete that. Um, for FIA, for Pennsylvania State Grant, we at FIA ask that you do the FAFSA because we need that to consider you for our Pennsylvania State Grant. And some scholarship organizations will ask that you complete the FAFSA because there might be a need-based component that goes along with that scholarship. 
This FAFSA is required every year that the student's going to attend college. So if you're going to a four-year school, you'll be doing four FAFSAs. The first year you do the FAFSA, you'll also complete a state grant form and high school form so that we can look at you for a Pennsylvania state grant. But that's only a one-time thing. Some schools, in addition to the FAFSA, will say we want additional forms completed. So they might ask you to complete the CSS profile form and the college board makes that available. So check on the college's websites to see if they're asking that you complete this, because if they are, you definitely want to do that. And by the deadline, the school issue to do it by, because that's the form they're using to determine what, whether or not you're um, eligible for the institutional aid. If they don't ask that you complete it, you don't have to do it. Um, and you don't want to do it because there is a cost associated with completing this form unless you meet the criteria to be considered for a waiver. And then some schools will ask for an additional institutional financial aid form. So basically you wanna go on each college's website that the student's applying to and make sure you know what forms they're requiring and by what deadlines. <clears throat> so this is what the screen will look like. It's on studentaid.gov, which is the federal website. This is where you'll go to complete the FAFSA. Um, that's the primary form for any federal aid, state aid and a lot of schools use to use it to determine if you're eligible for their aid. Again, you have to do this each year. 99% of those students apply online because it's faster, it's more secure. There's skip logic built into the FAFSA itself, which means based on the way you answer questions, they may allow you to skip other questions and there's some edits built in. If you really wanna do this via paper, you can go on the same website pull up a printable PDF version, complete it and print it and mail it in. But we don't suggest you do that. Um, in order for students to have information from the FAFSA center of their schools, they don't have to have been accepted yet for admissions for the schools. <clears throat> so normally the FAFSA becomes available October 1st. So you may have heard last year that they did something called FAFSA simplification and changed the FAFSA drastically and the needs analysis as well. So last year, the FAFSA was delayed till the very end of December. This year, it's going to be delayed again till December 1st. What they're doing is they're doing some test groups, or they call them beta tests with uh, smaller groups of families, completing the FAFSA and then trying to see where the glitches still are and hopefully cleaning a lot of that up before they open it to everybody on December 1st. So you can't really do the FAFSA yet, um, but in a normal year, year, you'll go back to October 1st. As far as Pennsylvania state grant deadlines, for most of our students, May 1st, 2025 is the deadline to complete that FAFSA. But if you're a first time student attending a specific type of institution, and you can see the types of schools listed there, community college, business trade and technical school, Hospital School of Nursing. There's some schools called open admissions institutions in Pennsylvania. So any type of school like that, if you're a first time student, you have to August 1st to complete your FAFSA to be considered for Pennsylvania State Grant. The next year, you won't be a first time student. You'll be back to that May 1st deadline. <clears throat> I'm just gonna skip this slide and go back to it in a minute. Um, <clears throat> So the FAFSA will ask a series of questions to the student to determine if they're dependent on their parents. So if they can answer no to all of these questions you see listed here, they're going to be considered a dependent student. And you can see that a lot of high school students are not gonna answer yes. They weren't born before 2002. They're not married, they're not a veteran. They aren't working on a graduate level degree, but there are some questions that they could answer yes to. And you'll see the rest of them there. They could be an orphan, in foster care, ward of the court, anytime since they turned 13. They may be in legal guardianship or be considered a legally emancipated minor. Or they could have legal dependents other than a spouse of their own that they provide support for. Finally, they could have been deemed homeless by proper authority. So if they can answer yes to any of these questions, they're considered independent and they won't need to get parent information on the FAFSA. I will tell you though, that other than the first four bullets, if the student answers yes to any of the other questions, they're probably going to be asked by FIA and the school for some more documentation to support that answer. So I'm gonna flip back to the slide before that. So we're assuming that our student um, was deemed dependent on their parents. So who's, who's the parent when they complete the FAFSA? 
if the parents are married and living together, both of their information will be provided on the FAFSA. If the biological parents never married, but they live together, both of their information will be provided on the FAFSA. If the parents are divorced or separated, the parent that provided the most financial support to the student over the past 12 months is the parent that will be completing the FAFSA. If the parents say, we provide equal financial support, the student invites the parent with the higher income and assets to complete the FAFSA. If that parent, whoever that parent is, that's completing the FAFSA has remarried, so there's a step parent in the picture, the step parent's information is always in, also included. So um, all, for all these types of uh, situations, now you now know who the parent will be when asked who the student has to invite. <clears throat> If the student has foster parents, legal guardians, or anybody else that they live with other than their parents, that information does not get reported on the FAFSA. So there is something behind the scenes in the FAFSA called the parent, FAFSA Parent Wizard. And actually, out on the studentaid.gov website, there is a link to parent, student, or FAFSA Parent Wizard that you can look at to help you determine who the parent will be that the information will be provided for in the FAFSA. So this, there will be questions asked in the FAFSA, which will help that student know who to invite. Remember, it's not always gonna be the parent that the student lives with, because it's the parent that provided more than 50% financial support. <clears throat> so as you're getting ready to complete the FAFSA, some things you should have prepared. Um, student and any parent contributor will need their social security numbers if they have one. And you wanna make sure to report this accurately. Because if you put, if you transpose a number and put the wrong social security number down, that's really hard to get fixed. So you want to make sure you're real careful when you're putting the social security number down. Email addresses will be asked for, and we tell the student not to use their high school email address because they won't have access to that after a certain point in time. For the 25-26 year, we're using 2023 federal tax information. Anybody that's contributing information to the FAFSA, so that would be the student and any parent contributors, will have to apply for studentaid.gov account. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. If the parents have to list their assets, here are some um, examples, and I'm pretty sure I have a slide later on that will give some more examples, but things like um, if you have anything in savings, checking, you, you're investing in the stock market, you have bonds, you may have a 529 for a student. Any information like that would be considered an asset and you'd have to list the value of that asset as of the day you're completing the FAFSA. Finally, if you're receiving any child support, you'd have to list the total child support you received from the most recently completed calendar year. <clears throat> so the roles within the FAFSA, there's the student. Um, if the student's married, it would be the student's spouse, the parent, would be putting information if it's a dependent student and if the parents married the parent's spouse. Um, all these are considered contributors to the FAFSA and all of these people that are going to be contributing information to the FAFSA have to get a studentaid.gov account. Now, one thing uh, we learned from this year from 24-25, the FAFSA used to be one form that would go back and forth between parent and student information. It's now kind of separate sections for the student and the parent contributors. So what we found, the flow that works the best is if the student starts the FAFSA, invites the parents, and then the parents go in and do their section. For some reason, when the parents started it and invited the parent, there seemed to be some technical difficulties. <clears throat> so I mentioned a contributor a couple times, and a couple of th things go into deciding who the contributor is. But one of the things is, say the parents are married, if they're filing a joint tax return, only one parent has to get that studentaid.gov account because they'll be able to pull over that tax return. If the parents are married or unmarried living together but did not file taxes jointly, then both of those parents need to get that studentaid.gov account because they're both going to have to pull over their separate tax returns. Everybody that's contributing information to the FAFSA has to provide consent. And what that is, is you're going to be pulling information directly over from the IRS and you're consenting to allow the FAFSA to then go out and send this information to all the schools you're listed on the FAFSA, 
and to FAPE so that we can consider you for Pennsylvania State Grant. So that's what you're actually consenting to. And the IRS direct data exchange, that's something that was new 2425 where you put your information in and that tax information is going to come right over. Now, in some cases, it doesn't work. And I put a couple examples on this slide. So if you've had a change in marital status, say, for example, since we're using the 2023 um, tax year, and in that year you were my married filing jointly, you're now separated. You don't want to pull over that married filing jointly tax return. You're going to want to manually enter your tax information in the, in the FAFSA. If the student filed a Puerto Rican or foreign tax return, that can't be pulled over. Or if the student or parent were a victim of identity theft involving their tax return, you'd have to manually enter the information on the FAFSA. So as I said, to create that studentaid.gov account, you're going to the same website, studentaid.gov. Um, you should do this at least four days prior to completing the FAFSA because all the information you put down has to be verified. And this acts as your legal signature on the FAFSA for both the student and any parent contributors. For the first time in 2425, they are letting users that don't have a social security number, not just that you don't remember, you don't actually have a social security number to set up a studentaid.gov account. But if you do that, say you're the parent of a student and have a social security number, you set up your studentaid.gov account, you won't be able to use that um, automatic pulling over of the tax feature. You'll have to manually enter all the tax information. But when you're setting up the studentaid.gov account, you're gonna put your social security number if you have it, email address, mobile phone, you'll answer some security questions, You'll enable two-step verification, and then you'll create a username and password. So once the student has that account number or account, the username and password, they log into the FAFSA. They get a couple videos. It's called onboarding steps, where the videos will talk about what the FAFSA is all about. Do you want to learn more about the FAFSA? What happens next? You can watch those videos, or you can skip through them. <clears throat> Your identity information will be verified because you put that username and password in. You'll provide consent, and then you'll fill out all the sections that are listed on the right. Personal circumstances, which are those questions to determine if you're dependent, some demographic information, financial information. You'll list all the colleges you want this information sent to, and then you'll invite the parent contributor, sign, and the student section will be complete. This is what the screen looks like for that dependent student to invite the parent or parents. So you can see here, um, they're going to need from the parent, they're, they're going to need the parent's social security number, date of birth, um, email address. They will need um, you know, to spell the name correctly. So they need all this personal information. So what I suggest is you have the student fill out their section and sit with the student. Give them this information to invite you so that they can invite you to complete your section of the FAFSA. And just as a reminder, if the parents are married filing a joint tax return, the student only has to invite one parent. If they're married filing separate tax returns, the student's going to invite both parents. Then the parent will get the email invite. They'll log in from that email from the link. They'll get the same onboarding steps that the student got. Their identity information will be verified. They'll provide consent. And then they complete some demographic information, some financial information, sign it, and confirm. This is the section of the FAFSA where the student lists the colleges they want the information sent to. They can list up to 20 schools. Um, only the school that you sent it to can see their information. So if you list at five schools, school one doesn't know the other four schools you listed. Student can go in and add or delete information at any time. So if they complete the FAFSA on December 1st and complete it with five schools, they, the next week they decide there's another school they want to apply to, they can go in and add that school. I will say, though, if they're applying to any Pennsylvania schools, list the Pennsylvania school in the first um, slot, because for Pennsylvania state grant purposes, we use the costs at that school you list in the first slot, because uh, Pennsylvania state grant is not only based on financial need, but it's based on the cost of the school the student's going to attend. If they decide to change it later on, they can always let us know, 
and we will be able to um, recalculate their state grant. <clears throat> and this uh, slide just shows more about the assets that would be listed. But if you look down the bottom, there's assets you don't list on the FAFSA and there's things like the value of your primary home, value of any qualified retirement accounts, value of life insurance policies, value of personal property, and the value of a 529 for any other family member. So you're only listing the amount you have for the student that you're completing the FAFSA for. Okay. And actually, when you're in the FAFSA, there are some help buttons, and there's a help button right next to the asset section. I always think it's a good idea to click on that help button so you can see here's the assets you're supposed to include, here's the assets you don't include, just so you're not including something you're not supposed to. This is what the signature page looks like. Um, for 24-25, you had to scroll all the way down to get to this section to click the box. I'm signing my FAFSA and hit submit. So a lot of people were saying, I don't know where I'm signing because they didn't scroll all the way down. I think they're supposed to be trying to get that all on one page for 25-26, but if not, just make sure you scroll all the way down and, and you'll see where you sign. Okay, so once the student signs, the parent is presented with what we call an abbreviated confirmation page, and it just talks about tracking the student's FAFSA form and what happens next. The student gets an email with the full detailed confirmation. So the FAFSA is now considered complete. It's submitted for processing, and the student will be able to go in at some point and look at their FAFSA submission summary. So as far as the Pennsylvania State Grant process, that also changed this year because in the past, before 24-25, once a student uh, was on the confirmation page because they submitted the FAFSA, there was a link where they could click click on that link and get right to the um, FIA form or the Pennsylvania State Grant application. That link is no longer there. So what we're doing at FIA is once we receive the results of the FAFSA, we're sending students an email and it will come from this web, or this um, email address, no reply at grantus.thea.org. This grant us is our new platform. So they will uh, get an email and it will tell them to come out to our website, activate their account, and they'll complete a state grant form and a high school form so that they're applying for Pennsylvania state grant. After they do that, they have to view the rights and responsibilities. So this blue tab you see here, they'll have to click on, and then they have to click, I've read and agree to these rights and responsibilities, and that acts as their electronic signature for the state grant form. So since we're using 2023 information, something could have changed. So maybe there's a divorced or separated uh, parent situation. Um, God forbid some of the other things uh, don't happen, recent death or disability. Um, maybe a high amount of unreimbursed medical or dental expenses, or somebody loses their job. Anything like this that causes a reduction in income, you should let the schools know that you're applying to and also let FIA know because both of those entities can come and ask you for some more documentation, take a look at it, and maybe use their professional judgment to use the more recent information. Also new on the FAFSA, it's something called the student unusual circumstances. So if you remember, I gave you the list of questions the students asked to determine if they're independent or dependent. So a student might not have been able to say yes to any of those questions, but they have an unusual circumstance where they don't have any contact with their parent. And there's some examples listed on this slide. If that's the case, they just answer yes to this question on the FAFSA, and then the school will get in touch with them and say, give us some more documentation and we're gonna take a look at this and decide if we'll make you independent using our professional judgment. So after the FAFSA is filed, as I said, information will go to FIA and all the college choices you listed. In a few days, an email gets sent to the student saying we've processed your FAFSA and you can go out and look at the FAFSA submission summary, which is a summary of everything you, you reported on the FAFSA. FIA sends that email out to the student to come to our website and create their Grant Us account and apply for Pennsylvania State Grant. The student should be encouraged to monitor their email that they use in the FAFSA because the schools and FIA may need more information and they'll get in touch with them via email. So they want to be monitoring that email. Once all this information is shared with the schools, the students accept it to the schools, 
schools will start sending out notifications telling that student what they're eligible for. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, you know, change gears here for a minute um, and talk about what the school does with that information. So they decide what the cost of attendance is at that school for that particular year. They look at the student's student aid index or SAI. That is what is determined by the information you completed on the FAFSA. So the difference between these two are the financial need, which the school is trying to work with. When they come up with that cost of attendance, here's the components they're using. Tuition and fees, housing and food, books. They might have course materials, supplies. They may have to have certain equipment, maybe a laptop that the school's requiring they purchase. They figure in a transportation expense and a personal expense. And that's how they decide for that school what it's going to cost that student for a year. So every school is going to be different with their cost of attendance. <clears throat> the SAI that's determined is primarily income driven. So it's mostly coming from the income. But they're looking at both parent and student income and assets. They're looking at the family size. And they're the big components that are used to determine what that student's SAI is. When they look at parent income, they make allowances for uh, payroll taxes that they know you have to pay. They make an allowance for two parent working household. And they also make an allowance, a living allowance based on the family size. If the family had to list assets, they use about 12% of the value of assets to uh, contribute towards that student aid index. When they look at the student's income, they're also making those allowances for payroll taxes. If the student worked under the federal work study program, which I'll explain in a minute what that is, those earnings are excluded from uh, the needs analysis. If they had a job other than a federal work study job, if they made less than $11,510, they're not looking at any of that information to go towards the student aid index. Anything over and above that, they're looking at 50% of that amount to put towards that SAI. And if the dependent student has any assets that they report in their own name, 20% of the value of those assets are used in the calculation for the student aid index. So basically what a school's doing to make it simple is they're taking COA, cost of attendance, they're deducting that student aid index or SAI. They're also deducting any outside financial assistance. So say a student received an outside scholarship or maybe the parents have a tuition remission so they deduct that and the difference is that financial need. And that's again, what the school is looking at to say, here's what I'm trying to meet as much of as possible, but a lot of schools cannot meet 100% of the financial need. And that's when the student will receive an official notification from the school. <clears throat> that notification is gonna list the type and amount of aid to be received. It will tell the student what they have to do to accept or reject any aid. And it will also tell them a little bit about their rights, responsibilities, and academic requirements to continue to receive aid. So when you receive those, uh, the financial aid package, some things you should take a look at. One is how much of that financial aid is free money, because you want to make sure you see what I don't have to repay. Which awards are based on need? Because your need could change every year. Remember, you're filling that FAFSA out every year. Somebody gets a huge promotion with a huge salary increase, their financial need could change. Which awards are based on merit? So some schools will tell the student, and it's usually based on what they did in high school, um, and it usually comes with the admissions uh, letter. They'll say, by the way, we're giving you a certain amount of money each year for the next four years. However, there might be some conditions on keeping that. They might have to keep a certain grade point average. Or if they got it because they were in a certain major, maybe they have to stay in that major. So you wanna know the answers to those questions. Will awards increase as tuition increases? Will the awards change from year to year? And finally, will you need to take out loans? And if so, how much? Is it just a student loan? Is it a parent loan? Um, how much debt are you gonna go into? What do you feel comfortable with? <clears throat> so federal and state aid, the main federal program that the student will be considered for is called the federal Pell Grant. So you'll see what the maximum is there for 24-25. Um, for we don't know what it is for 25-26 yet. We won't know that probably until, you know, next spring. FSEOG, Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, that's another federal grant your schools will determine your eligibility for. 
and preference is given to students that are the most needy students that are Pell eligible students. So again, your schools will let you know if you're eligible for that. Federal work study, which I referenced a few times, you have to have financial need in order to qualify for this. The school takes a look at that and says, maybe I'll offer this student federal work study, which is a job on campus. So the money doesn't get taken off right um, from your tuition bill or your room and board. The student has to get the job once, once they get to campus and they start getting paid in a check. They use that money they get paid in a check by and um, put that towards their educational expenses. For Pennsylvania State Grant, for 24-25, uh, the year we're in, the maximum award is $5,750. And that's for a full-time student. Half-time students can get this, so they would just get half of whatever their full-time award is. If you go out of state, you cannot take the Pennsylvania State Grant with you unless you go to one of our reciprocal states, and they're listed here, Delaware, D.C., Massachusetts, Ohio, Vermont, and West Virginia. However, the max you can get if you go to one of those states is $600 for a full-time student and $800 for veterans. So it's going to be less if you go to um, one of the reciprocal states. So the maximum award a student can receive uh, if they're in Pennsylvania, you'll see the maximums here. The minimum is 500, but there's different tiers because as I mentioned before, the Pennsylvania State Grant is not only based on financial need, it's also based on the different cost tiers in Pennsylvania. So you'll see the maximum, the first tier probably is the students attending a community college. Second tier would probably be one of the PASHE state schools. Third tier would be the state related schools. And then the final tier is usually the four year privates. <clears throat> so federal student loans, um, the good news about the Federal Direct Student Loan Program is that every student, regardless of need, can get a Federal Direct Student Loan. The school looks at the results of the FAFSA and decides whether or not the student has financial need. If they do, they can offer them an, a subsidized loan, which means the federal government's going to pay the interest on behalf of the student while they're in school and during the six-month grace period after graduation. If they don't qualify for that, they get an unsubsidized loan but the interest is accruing while they're in school and doing the grace period. A student can choose to pay that interest on a quarterly basis while in school, which will lower their payments at the back end, but they don't have to. Uh, the interest rates for this loan are set every July 1st. So the interest rate for this year is 6.53%, and there's a fee of 1.057% taken off the top of the loan. So this is the interest rate for this year. We don't know what it will be yet for 25-26. Once the student graduates, there's uh, a few flexible repayment options they can select from, so their payments are hopefully doable with their budget. <clears throat> so this chart shows how much a student can borrow under this program. If they're a first-year student, they can borrow up to $5,500 no more than $3,500 of that can be subsidized. So if they show financial need, the school will say, um, okay, we can give you $3,500 subsidized. The other $2,000 has to be unsubsidized. If they show no financial need, that whole $5,500 could be sub unsubsidized. Second year, they can get $6,500, and third year and beyond, they can get $7,500. For a four-year undergrad program, they can't borrow more than $31,000. If you look at that third column there, that there are the amounts that independent students can borrow, but also amounts that dependent students whose parents are unable to borrow a PLUS loan can get some extra money. So the next slide I'm going to show you is about the parent PLUS loan. If a parent decides to apply for that and gets turned down, the student can borrow $4,000 additional unsubsidized in their own name. So the Federal Direct PLUS loan is for parents of dependent undergrad students. The loan is in the parent's name, but it's for the student's costs. And the parent can borrow whatever the cost of attendance is for that student minus any financial aid the student received. Just like the student loan, the rates are set every July 1st, but you can see these rates are a lot higher. They're 9.08%. And the fee that gets taken off the top is higher also, 4.228%. So you just want to be careful what you borrow here because 
this uh, loan program is has a very lenient credit check. They're only making sure you don't have adverse credit. So sometimes you can get approved for this, but you might not ever have the ability to repay. So I always say, just be careful how much you borrow under this program. You have to reapply each year. You can choose to have the principal defer while the student's in school, but the interest continues to accrue. And remember, if the parent's denied, the student can get an additional $4,000 on sub in their name. Okay. So you only want to consider these direct plus or alternative loans um, after all, after you're looking into all other sources, of course. So private loans, as I said, are um, another source that a student can look into. They are, a lot of private lenders have these loans. They have uh, student uh, lenders, credit unions, banks. Um, we at FIA have a private loan. So you can go to any one of these entities to apply for one of these alternative or private loans. The loan is in the student's name. There's usually a co-signer required because they're doing a full credit check. So they're looking at credit scores, debt to income ratio. Um, so, you know, they're they're probably gonna need a co-sign. You can borrow up to the cost of attendance, just like the PLUS loan minus any financial aid the student received. And just like the PLUS loan, the principal can be deferred while the student's in school, but the interest will continue to accrue. And the terms vary by lender. So you have to compare before making choices. Um, I'm just going to give you an example. As I said, there's plenty of products out there, but our FIA PA Forward loan, if you're interested in looking at that, you just go to fia.org slash PA Forward. But I just want you to see for our loan, for this year, here's our interest rate range. So if somebody has really good credit, they might get a lesser interest rate than the PLUS loan, and there's no upfront fees for this loan. So that's why I'm saying you should compare the plus loan with the private loans. And if you're looking at a couple different private loans, just compare all the different terms. Okay, scholarships. Uh, Post-secondary schools may have their own scholarships that they offer students. So you wanna find out you know, what they are on their website. And also, you know, are there additional applications you have to complete and by what deadlines? There's local and regional scholarships. And a lot of times guidance offices are a really good, the high school guidance office is really good at letting students know about the regional and local scholarships they're aware of. And then there's national scholarships. So as far as scholarship tips, we always tell students start searching early, use free scholarship search sites, don't ignore scholarships with smaller amounts because they can add up. And usually the ones with the smaller amounts are less competitive than the ones with the larger amounts. Definitely don't miss the deadlines and you can search for scholarships every year. So if you don't want to get one as a freshman, you can apply for one the next year. Scholarships aren't always based on just strictly GPA, because I know a lot of people think that, and that's not the case. It can be maybe the student did a lot of community service while in high school. They may have played a certain instrument or played a sport or belonged to a club. They may have even been employed by um, an employer that give scholarships to students once they uh, start school, college. So the criteria is all over the place. This list is some scholarship search en engines that we're aware of that are free and legitimate. It's not exhaustive, but these are scholarships that are websites that you can use to look for scholarships. Some resources, FIA.org, which is FIA's website and has a lot of great information about financial aid. We also have something called Education Planner on our website, which is not only about financial aid, but um, about careers and what you might be interested in, also about how to apply to, to colleges. And so more information about education, not just about financial aid. My Smart Borrowing, we also have on our website, and that's where a student can go through a uh, kind of a quiz and answer some questions. And then it shows them, it just, just kind of shows them how not to get into more debt than you should get into. You can deal with it as a financial literacy website. And that has some good calculators on the website. Um, for example, they have a calculator. If I borrow this amount over four years, I have this interest rate and I have 10 years of repay. What's my monthly payment going to look like? There's our FIA toll-free number. If you have any questions of FIA, the federal student aid information number, that's there. Um, that is a number you can call while completing the FAFSA to get assistance. 
studentaid.gov is a one-stop shop for everything federal. So that's where you're applying for your studentaid.gov account. That's where you're going to complete the FAFSA and that's where you'll get any information you need about any federal programs. If you wanna scan this QR code, feel free to do that. Um, it's just, we, as we find out information, we send emails to students. So if you wanna learn more about any funding that we're aware of or any information about loans, grants, you know, we'll send emails out. So you're welcome to scan the QR code. On our website, we also have a section called Financial Aid Resources under Tools, and there's information for counselors and for parent and students. So things you can be doing now, definitely visiting college websites and visiting colleges. Um, every college is required to have a net price calculator on their website, and that's where they'll say, this is our sticker price. You put in some information, and they say, this is probably what the net price will be for you. So kind of, you know, helping you to decide, well, maybe I can apply to this school. You know, maybe we could afford it after we receive financial aid. There's also a federal student aid estimator on the studentaid.gov website where you can get an idea of what your student aid index would be for that SAI. Students should be exploring scholarships. If they're seniors, they can create that FSA ID or studentaid.gov account, which is the new name, but they cannot complete the FAFSA yet. They can't do that until uh, December 1st. We at FIA put all kinds of stuff on all the social media um, platforms, so look for that. Again, there's my information, including my email address. Um, if after this, you know, even if it's a month down the line and you think something, feel free to, to give me a call or, or send me an email, I should say, because I, I only have my email address up there, and I'll be glad to try to answer your questions. So that was a lot. <laughs> Thank um, you, Fran. I did have a couple emails that came through okay. uh, with some questions. So one is if you could talk a little bit about a student who lives with a guardian, um, does not reside with biological parent. And um, I think you touched on that as far as the FAFSA goes that they might qualify as an independent, um, but that was part one. And part two of that is, um, can the guardian take out loans on behalf of the student? Um, if they are not legally adop adopted by the guardian. Okay, so part one, if they're in legal guardianship, it has to have been, it has to have gone through the court, courts. Because a lot of times I'll see maybe a student come to a, an evening I'm doing and it'll be, they'll be with a grandparent. The grandparent says, I have custody, but they don't have legal guardianship. So it has to have gone through the court. So if they are a legal guardian, that student's going to be considered independent because they're going to say yes to that question on the FAFSA, so they won't be asked for any parent information. The legal guardian cannot take a federal plus loan out on behalf of that student. Some of the private loans they can then. So I'm pretty sure our PA court allows a legal guardian. Not exactly sure you can go on the website and it, I think it will tell you that. But um, as far as the federal plus loan, no, it has to be one of the biological parents. Okay, thank you. Um, another question I had was regarding the FSA ID and um, families having a difficult time creating the username. Is that anything that you've heard about? Uh, I know last year for 2425, there were problems. Um, I thought they kind of worked out most of those kinks. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what exactly was the issue with creating the username. I know they have requirements like you can't use any part of your name like I couldn't say Fran in my username that kind of thing mm -hmm. so I don't know what issue they had but if they can't create if they're unable to create that they have to call that 1-800 number that student aid dot, uh, that I gave you on the resource page and say hey I'm having a trouble can you help me walk through this and I know last year or for 24 25 it was really difficult to get a hold of anybody on that customer service number or you would get through and get hung up on Mm -hmm. They, from what I'm told, they're hiring a bunch more people to help. And um, so it should be better. So if you have trouble getting that FSA ID, give them a call. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so as Fran said, you can either email her if you have additional questions, or you can certainly email me and I'll make sure that I get those questions to Fran as well. Uh, my email is fim at pdsd.org, or you have Fran McKeon's um, email address there on the slideshow as well. 
Um, we will be posting this um, presentation to our website and also emailing it out uh, through a YouTube link once we get it uploaded tomorrow. So we thank everyone for joining and we thank Fran uh, tremendously for all of your um, knowledge that you're sharing with everyone. And we do appreciate you joining us every year. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. Good luck, thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Fran. You're welcome. <laughs>